How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. I'd rather be out there. I don't blame you, but we're going to have a good talk in here. We have two very good scholars, um, one from Hamlin University School of Law, Professor David Schultz, and then Hilly Shapiro of the Cato Institute. My name is Adam Hansen. I'm the president of the Willie Mitchell Federalist Society. Um, we're very pleased to have um, our distinguished guests, as well as all of you here, spending your afternoon on this beautiful Tuesday or Monday afternoon. Um, I'd like to first introduce Mr. Ilya Shapiro. Mr. Shapiro is the editor-in-chief um, at the Cato Institute of your uh, Supreme Court Review. While at the Cato Institute, Mr. Shapiro has um, helped author and uh, submit over 100 amicus briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Shapiro is a regular contributor to, ver contributor to various uh, national news organizations and was even on the Colbert Report um, a couple years ago talking about the district of the, Colum or the uh, McDonald gun case at the Supreme Court. Before joining Cato, he was an advisor at the law firms of Patton and Boggs and Clear Dot Live on areas of international, political, commercial, and antitrust litigation. Mr. Shapiro has been an adjunct professor at the George Washington School of Law and clerk for Judge E. Grady Jolly of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Mr. Shapiro holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University, a Master of Science degree from the London School of Economics, and his law degree from the University of Chicago School of Law. Now, if you're feeling adventurous, you could ask a question to Mr. Shapiro a little later. And in any number of five languages, including English, he's a native speaker of Russian, he's fluent in Spanish and French, and is proficient in Italian and Portuguese. So, if any of those are your languages, I'm sure you can ask him to answer questions. Um, so, I'd like to turn the floor over now to uh, Alex Davis, who's the president of the American Constitution Society, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Schultz, for coming here, and everyone for being here today. Um, we're looking forward to hearing our speakers talk about this issue. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the American Constitution so Society, or ACS, is a national network of lawyers, law students, judges, and attorneys, uh, and policymakers who believe that uh, the law should be used as a force for good to help people in their lives. Um, ACS works for positive change by shaping the debate of important legal and constitutional issues through the development and promotion of a progressive vision of our constitutional laws. <clears throat> and if you're interested about ACS, we can talk about later on. But uh, now I'd like to talk about our guest speaker, Professor David Schultz. And Professor Schultz is a Hamlin University professor of political science who teaches courses in public policy and administration, campaigns and elections, and government ethics. Uh, professor Schultz is also a professor at Hamlin Law School where he teaches election law. Uh, professor Schultz has authored 29 books and over 100 articles on various aspects of the Amer American politics Election law, the media, and politics. I'm writing another one now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and based and uh, Mr. Professor Schultz, his most recent book is American Politics in the Age of Ignorance and Why Lawmakers Choose Belief Over Research. And he is also a two-time Fulbright Scholar who has taught extensively in Europe and is also a Leslie A. winning. Whittington, National Award winner for Excellence in Public Affairs Teaching. And the format we have today is a, be a debate where each speaker will be allotted 20 minutes to speak, and then they will be given 10 minutes in a rebuttal. And then at the end, if we have time, uh, we'll field questions. Uh, both the speakers will field questions. And uh, without further ado, I believe Mr. Shapiro, you are first. Thanks very much for, uh, for hosting me. I understand that uh, I've come at a weather that's pretty typical for Minnesota. You know, we, we had a tough winter in, in D.C., so it's nice to come here to the, the warmer areas with the nice sunshine. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, President Obama's curious relationship with the Constitution. Um, this president has done more than any other president in modern times, really. Um, to uh, bring the Constitution back into the public discourse. Unfortunately, he's done this not so much by talking about the constitutional aspects uh, or justifications for various policies, but by uh, ignoring and violating the strictures of our founding document. 
or I should say your founding document. I'm not quite a citizen yet. I have my naturalization test this coming Friday, so I'm studying up on the branch of the government and uh, things like that. Um, my presentation is going to be split. It's going to be pretty going through a lot of different types of issues, but like Gaul, it's going to be split in three. Obamacare, Supreme Court advocacy, and kind of potpourri or grab bag of, of uh, other types of issues. It's really hard to limit myself to only having a third being on Obamacare, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, if you want more detail, uh, I have a couple of uh, op-eds the end of 2011, the end of 2013, Obama's top 10 constitutional violations for those years, some that goes into legislation, some that goes into executive action. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the, the, the attitude of uh, this president, who was taught at the University of Chicago while I was there, I didn't have a class from him, uh, but uh, I bumped into him in the halls a couple of times, um, seems to be epitomized by an initiative that was started not when he was reelected, not kind of this lame duck legacy building uh, aspect to his presidency, but fairly early on with the we can't wait initiative. That is, when Congress won't act, I will, or we will, depending on who's, uh, who's speaking. And this has been applied uh, across the board to issue areas from uh, economic stimulus to uh, environmental regulation, uh, uh, immigration, uh, education, a whole host of areas uh, that the president has said that Congress, because it won't legislate, um, I guess invoking the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution that, you know, for a bill to become a law, you have to have both houses pass and the President sign it, except apparently when something's very important and Congress won't act, then the President can act uh, on his own. Um, and the flip side of that is uh, the suspension of the law. There was a very important hearing in the House Judiciary Committee in December, um, this past December, uh, about the Take Care Clause, the presidential duty to take care uh, that the laws be faithfully executed. Uh, and there was a wide range of testimony, um, not just by you know, libertarian ideologues, there was a professor from GW, John Turley, who's no, you know, doesn't have an ideological axe to grind in particular, but, uh, going into the history of the suspension of the laws and why kind of arbitrarily applying laws is uh, such an affront uh, to the rule of law. Um, indeed, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, one of the biggest complaints that the founding generation had was that King George would uh, arbitrarily apply the law to his political enemies and you know, suspend it when it was uh, worth doing and what have you. And, and that's the third point, right? Uh, creating your own law uh, without uh, Congress acting, suspending the law, uh, enforcing it arbitrarily, uh, and uh, using the force of government to punish political enemies. Those are kind of the three big problems, uh, and all because we can't wait to fundamentally transform the country, as he promised in his first election campaign. Uh, as, as Ted Cruz said uh, at the Gridiron Club, I'm pretty sure he had uh, uh, guest writers to help him with some of these jokes, but he said, we, we live under the rule of law in this country, of course, we have to ask every day, I have to ask Barack Obama every day what that law is. So, uh, let's get right into it here. Um, uh, with Obamacare, in February of last year, the Labor Department issued a guidance, okay, not a rulemaking, not a, you know, if you take administrative law, there wasn't notice and comment and issue a rule or a regulation, was not, not a piece of legislation, but a guidance to waive uh, the imposition of out-of-pocket caps, that is, uh, the Affordable Care Act caps how much an <coughs> individual can spend per year and per lifetime uh, on their health care. And the Labor Department, citing kind of confusion and you know, employers and regulators couldn't get it, get their acts together, they delayed it for a year. Now, it might be good policy, but there was no statutory authority for them to do that. Uh, July 4th of last year, in fact, on a Friday afternoon, as everybody was leaving town for the, uh, for the holiday weekend, there was a blog post, now, not a guidance anymore, now this is a blog post, uh, announcing a delay of the employer mandate, the requirement that employers uh, over 50 employees uh, provide a certain level of health insurance coverage. This time, uh, there was a very sophisticated blog post. There was a statutory citation there. Unfortunately, it was to a part of the law uh, giving the Secretary of Health and Human Services discretion to waive certain disclosure requirements, paperwork uh, requirements about how the mandate's working, not the mandate itself. But I guess they're trying. They're throwing in some statutory authority there. And of course, uh, 
uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, the employer mandate was delayed again until April uh, 2016 with another tier of mid-level employers between 50 and 100 employees, kind of a sliding scale of how many people need to be covered, what you need to show, and what you need to sign, all these things. Very sophisticated kind of scheme, again, kind of made up out of, out of thin air uh, by uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, next is probably the biggest uh, violation, uh, I guess, or certainly highest profile. You know, if you like it, you can keep it. That statement that you know, people are satisfied with the policy, they get to keep them, which of course they can't because otherwise Obamacare falls apart. You know, the, everybody being covered at a certain level and what the costs have to be and the premiums to calibrate it, you know, like it or, or, or don't, you know, the Affordable Care Act sets out a very kind of a, a calibrated, balanced scheme of, of changing the health care system can't possibly work with uh, these non-compliant uh, policies, but uh, because of the uproar uh, by a presidential um, press conference this time, they're very creative on how they do these things, uh, in November, uh, President Obama announced that that would be delayed for a year, and last month it was delayed again until October 2016. Hmm, what happens in November 2016? It looks like it's uh, right for some more political thing back down the road. Those are the huge uh, uh, big, uh, significant issue in terms of health care and the economy. Um, uh, much more symbolic, I mean, less of a money issue, but very symbolic uh, of this abuse of power uh, and unconstitutional action was last August uh, when kind of Congress is on recess, there's tumbleweed going down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, you know, I live in downtown DC, you know, no one's there. Uh, and in, in the dead of summer, uh, the president directed the Office of Personnel Management to exempt Congress from the requirements of the Affordable Care Act. Um, which is nice, kind of you know, crony, cronyism, sort of patronage, and, and, and what have you, which is bad enough as it is, we can talk about that, but it's also against the law. Uh, the Republicans, during the uh, course of the debate over the health care reform, <coughs> introduced what they thought would be a poison pill amendment, that is to require Congress and their staffs to abide by, uh, by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but that ended up passing, and it was politically hard to reject, uh, until uh, the president uh, ended up exempting Anyway, uh, and then there's some ongoing litigation over, over this one. It's kind of complicated. The IRS um, instituted subsidies uh, for people all across the country uh, uh, to be able to buy plans on the uh, health care exchanges if their employer isn't providing them. The problem with that is that the statute, the, the text of the law, uh, says that these subsidies are supposed to be, or tax credits are only supposed to be provided in states that set up their own exchanges. Um, and lo and behold, they weren't expecting this, but only 16 states have decided to set up their own exchanges. So most of the country is not, and therefore, on the text of the Affordable Care Act, their residents, their citizens, should not be eligible for these subsidies, which again, would you know, throw the whole uh, edifice of the law, how the healthcare system is now supposed to function, uh, into disarray. Uh, but the IRS uh, read that as saying, well, uh, if the federal government comes in and sets up an exchange in a state, that's the same thing as a state setting it up. Uh, not looking at the fact that this is kind of a fairly common mechanism uh, to incentivize states to put in types of uh, federal programs. Uh, states uh, cannot be commandeered, cannot be forced by the federal government to enforce federal law, which is why the Affordable Care Act was written in such a way that the feds would come in and the states declined. Uh, and here the, the IRS is essentially saving the program uh, because uh, as it played out, uh, as I said, not that many states decided to set up these uh, exchanges. And there's at least four lawsuits going on around the country. I think three of them are now at the appellate level. We'll see what happens, but it's a question of statutory interpretation. This isn't the Commerce Clause or some of the constitutional things. But the IRS again is acting, um, which of course is part of the executive branch without any sort of uh, statutory authority in shoring up uh, the functioning of, uh, of the legislation. And staying on the topic of the IRS, uh, we of course have the biggest scandal, and probably uh, the biggest uh, sole single violation uh, of, the, of the Constitution, of the rule of law in this administration, the political profiling by the IRS of uh, enemies of the administration, of organizations that um, talk about everything from lower taxes to uh, debt balancing, uh, that have the words Tea Party or Israel for some reason in their names, uh, whose activities include education about the Constitution. When I started writing about this, I uh, apologized to my wife uh, preemptively in case we'd be audited, because that 
that's what I do. Um, and uh, this scandal, of course, is, is still uh, developing. You know, there's a stone wall and a slow roll of the documents from the IRS going to the House Committee. Um, if, if the Republicans take the Senate in the fall, we'll probably see heightened pressure on this and a, a greater showdown between uh, the branches. But this harkens to something that we haven't really seen since Nixon, you know, using the, the leaders of the state to go after uh, um, uh, the people, uh, agents that they disagree with. Uh, I skipped ahead a little bit to kind of the smorgasbord, but returning to what I said was kind of my second large topic, the Supreme Court. Um, the last few terms, the Obama administration has been uh, not been very successful uh, at the Supreme Court. Last term alone, the Solicitor General's office won fewer than 40% of its cases against uh, historical uh, uh, average of about 70% for the government before the Supreme Court. But that's not even what I mean here in terms of uh, uh, making outlandish uh, constitution breaking arguments before the, before the court, because you can argue that uh, a lot of these cases, or at least some of them, uh, you have a 5-4 conservative majority on the court, well, of course, this is a little administration, and they'll lose a disproportionate amount of these cases, probably not 40, you know, 60 plus percent, but nevertheless. Just looking at the unanimous rulings against uh, this administration, um, this Solicitor General's office, whether it's Don Morelli or Lena Kagan before him, uh, have been losing unanimous uh, uh, cases, or cases unanimously, uh, at a rate three to four times greater than uh, President Bush and two to three times greater than President Clinton. In the last two terms, the last two years, depending on how you count, uh, that's 10 or 11 uh, of these unanimous rulings, where they haven't even gotten a uh, the vote of the justices that President Obama himself uh, appointed, so the minority in Cayman, and a range in uh, areas of law from criminal procedure to immigration to securities law to tax policy to uh, religious liberty to property rights, uh, and the list goes on. These cases have nothing in common with each other other than uh, just a breathtakingly broad uh, view of federal power that the Solicitor General is bringing into court. Uh, I'll give you an example, I'll give you a few examples. You might have heard the, uh, the Arizona immigration law, right, that was so uh, offensive and controversial and, and, and things like this. Well, most of the law has been in effect now for over four years. I disagree with it, by the way. I think it's not the way you know, I and Cato are for liberalizing immigration policy and stuff and economic and cultural reasons, but I won't get into that. Uh, the issue here is whether the state has passed laws that conflict with federal law. And the Supremacy Clause says that when the federal government uh, is acting lawfully, a state can't pass a law to conflict uh, with, with that law. Um, most of the law has been in effect. And only six provisions were challenged by the federal government, and they lost it on two of those in the lower courts and didn't appeal. So there were four at issue before the Supreme Court, and the federal government won on three of those, Arizona won on one of those. That one was the unanimous ruling, and it was the most controversial uh, part of the Arizona law. The uh, show me your papers, please. Right? If a uh, law enforcement officer lawfully detains someone and then they have uh, reasonable suspicion to believe the person's in the country illegally, they're supposed to check with the um, Department of Homeland Security or its agents uh, to verify the immigration status. And um, the administration said that uh, that goes against uh, immigration enforcement priorities or resource allocations, things like this. And the court rejected that 9 nothing because that's an argument for preemption by executive whim. Um, you know, resource allocations or enforcement priorities are not law. And tomorrow, if there's a change of policy, uh, a new president, a new secretary of Homeland Security, or just a change of policy, all of a sudden state law and the administration's argument would be uh, reconstitutional or unpreempted, or whatever the case may be. And that, that's certainly, uh, that's a, it's a breathtaking assertion of, uh, of executive power. On the uh, property rights front, there was a case called uh, Arkansas Game and Fish versus Army Corps of Engineers. So there's clear precedent that says if the government floods your land permanently, causing damage, you can recover under the Fifth Amendment takings clause, uh, just compensation. If the government uh, periodically invades your land you know, physically, um, causing damage, you can recover under the Fifth Amendment. This was a case of periodic, but fairly regular flooding. Um, and, the, and the government said, well, you know, here they shouldn't be able to recover because 
It's not permanent flooding and it's not physical invasion. And the court, in an opinion by that rabid right-winger, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, said, uh, no, uh, of course this is uh, recoverable. Uh, on religious liberty, going even further than what the Bush administration was arguing in terms of there was a dispute, I won't get into it too much, in, in Michigan about a teacher who was fired in a religious school and uh, you know, was she a religious teacher so, so that you know, they could get certain exemptions from employment discrimination laws, all these sort of things. Um, the Obama administration came in and said not just you know, that this teacher because she teaches math rather than theology or what have you doesn't qualify them, you know, all these different laws apply. They said there should be no exemptions from employment discrimination laws for uh, religious institutions. Uh, so I guess Catholic churches have to hire Jews and Jewish synagogues have to hire Muslims and, and all the rest of it. It's known as the ministerial exemption and, and that argument was rejected, not nothing, uh, by the Supreme Court. I, I, I could go on. I mean, there's like just absurd securities arguments, double taxation arguments, uh, uh, really uh, uh, shocking sort of things. And, and this has, I think, uh, continued this term uh, with for example, the recess appointments uh, argument. This was kind of a combination of presidential action um, and then uh, taken to the Supreme Court. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. This is the Noel Canning versus National Labor Relations Board case. Uh, the, um, the president appointed, uh, reported to appoint three new members of the NLRB, very important agency that deals with industrial relations, unions, and employers, and so forth. Um, during a time that he considered the Senate to be in recess. And the President, under the Constitution, has the power to make appointments during a recess uh, of the Senate. The lower court, the D.C. Circuit, ended up throwing out those uh, appointments uh, because the recess, or the purported recess when the President um, uh, made the appointments was an intra-session, not an inter-session recess. Because remember, way back when, uh, the Senate was only in session two or three months of the year. Uh, then they went back to their home states and you couldn't find them, you couldn't summon them, you know, communication and travel being what it was. Um, the president needed to have the government uh, function. You know, the deputy secretary of war died, he needed to replace that or uh, the government shuts down in lots of ways. So that's what he had. But now, you know, things uh, figure uh, a little differently. So anyway, inter versus intra session recesses and also that the vacancy has to arise during the recess. So if it arises when the Senate's in session, well, the president can send somebody up and the Senate can confirm them. If the Senate doesn't, then it goes to the voters. The President can say, the Senate's a do-nothing Senate, or, or they can make an accommodation with the Senate. Anyway, it looks like the Supreme Court, by a rather large majority, you know, not five to four, will probably grapple or, or, or uh, latch onto a, a third uh, type of argument made, ironically, by Miguel Estrada, who himself uh, was uh, part of a controversy under the Bush administration, who was nominated the D.C. Circuit and filibustered a number of times because as it came out, he was Latino and Democrats didn't want to give the Republicans an opportunity to appoint the first Latino justice. Uh, so anyway, he made an argument on behalf of all of the Republicans in the Senate saying that regardless of what the proper definition of a vacancy or uh, a recess or when the Senate concession is, that's a judgment that's left to the Senate. Uh, and I think that's what the, uh, uh, that's what the Constitution said. Each, each body is the, to be the judge of its own rules and procedures. And uh, I think we'll see a unanimous or nearly so uh, opinion on, on that regard. Um, let's move to something that you probably haven't heard. I think most of you have probably heard of most of these things that I've mentioned today. Um, last year, uh, after some allegations of improper handling of, of uh, some complaints of, of sexual harassment and maybe even assault in the University of Montana system, um, the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, together with the Justice Department, issued a guidance uh, or a letter that was meant to be a, a national blueprint or, or guidance for public uh, institutions um, of higher education that uh, was part speech code, part institution of kangaroo courts. By which I mean that uh, any unwelcome uh, uh, communication or speech uh, between people that can be characterized in a somewhat sexual way uh, is runs afoul uh, of this particular guidance. So you know, I, I would warn you, Lonnie Mitchell is a private institution, right? Okay, so you might, you, might, you might be a little safe, but when I talk at public schools, I say, you know, watch out next time you're in bar review you or you're flirting with your crush or what have you. You know, if they're creeped out, that, you know, might be violating the, uh, the, the, the new executive speech code. But even worse than that First Amendment affront is the due process problem. 
uh, and cases like this have already happened in the Wall Street Journal on the news side. I'm not even talking about the editorial side. It's been covering uh, cases where um, uh, someone has had uh, disciplinary action taken against them uh, even before they're notified of their charges, kind of an ex parte preliminary injunction, if you will, uh, and then they're not allowed to have a lawyer, and then the standard for conviction and punishment is not, you know, something high, but just a preponderance of the evidence. I mean, it's, if, if, if something like this existed in, in the uh, criminal justice system, we would all be laughing at it, but we, uh, we don't hear about it, because it's just, you know, college kids having fun um, you know, making uh, sexist jokes or, or, or what have you. Kids have been suspended and expelled uh, over this, even after, you know, there have been lots of cases where there have been false rape allegations and the DA has declined to pursue charges and, and things like this. Moving on to something yet again completely different. I think this is really. Can I step down? Yeah, I'm sorry. We reached out of the 20 minute period. We'll, we'll oh, I didn't get like a two minute or anything. Oh, okay, I'll wrap up. No, I'll wrap yeah, up. I'm sorry. Do you want to just take two minutes to, to uh, wrap up? I'm apologize. not going to use 10 minutes for rebuttal anyway. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a really good example uh, uh, that you probably have heard of of uh, the, the Mini Dream Act. As I said, an immigration uh, a policy or non policy that we have. Um, certainly one of the more sympathetic aspects of it is you know, uh, people that were brought here illegally as infants, as kids, uh, and now want to go to college or join the military or whatever the case may be, and you know, not, not involved in, in criminal activity and the rest of it. Uh, and for a long time, President Obama, to his credit, when he was being criticized uh, by uh, immigration activists, said, I can't do anything about this. Uh, you know, this is for Congress to act. But all of a sudden, about a year and a half ago, he changed his tune. Uh, and now, not only do we have a deferral of deportation and deferral of enforcement and uh, uh, these sorts of things, which arguably uh, could have, you know, you could make a, a legal argument for that. It's like the uh, policy on, on, on marijuana, for example. You know, local line prosecutors can decide that they want to prosecute armed robbers and murderers rather than jaywalkers. Similarly, you can have enforcement priorities on the immigration side, and maybe you can have a, a, a national guidance coming from the Justice Department or the DHS or whatever about that. So that's not even the most problematic side of this. But on top of just the decisions not to deport or, or prosecute or, or uh, enforce uh, the laws against these types of people, the, the dreamers, uh, there's been a new type of uh, green card or, or visa created for them, uh, the full cloth. Uh, that you get a certain document that allows you to, to work and, and stay in the country and it's renewable and, you know, until Congress gets its act together. That's probably good policy. We should have something like that. Um, the president can't simply, uh, the, executive, the executive branch can't make that up at a whole plot. So, uh, you know, we can go on and on about uh, the administration, the, the Interior Department being held in contempt of court for reimposing a drilling moratorium uh, after the Deepwater Horizon explosion. The rulings against tobacco labeling requirements from the FDA is violating the First Amendment. I mean, there's like a whole lot of things. This is even before we get to the uh, NSA, which I would argue uh, isn't a Constitutional issue it might be some statutory form on the policy side, and before we get to you know, all these, a whole host of, of, of other areas. Um, but what's indicative of what's going on here is a uh, senior counselor now to the president in the last couple of years, John uh, Podesta, since the election, uh, wrote an important paper a few years ago talking about how the administration has an opportunity to change the focus away from the divided Congress and the unappetizing process, uh, uh, process of making legislative sausage. Um, and uh, I think that's what my tour de raison, if you will, uh, has been all about. Um, you know, it's not about the number of executive orders or, or, or things like that, but it's just brazenly knowing that you know, the, 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 we, the technocrats, know what's best in every area of law. And we, you know, if Congress is recalcitrant and won't act, we will simply uh, shape the law, suspend the law, add new laws, uh, argue for ridiculous positions in the Supreme Court. Uh, until uh, we get our way through. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, and uh, that's the relationship of this administration and the Constitution. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Obama versus the Constitution. That's the best you can do instead of, instead of arguments. You don't like Obama's politics. And therefore, what you simply do is make the argument that what he's doing is unconstitutional. In so many ways, I listen to your arguments and walk away thinking to myself two things. First, you can't get over the fact that they got Nixon 
And second, you can't get over the fact that the New Deal exists. I'm going to make three arguments. First, the irony of the positions of it that you're taking. Second, the argument is that you confuse policy wisdom and aptness or ineptness in an administration with constitutionality. And third, you've developed a wooden, crab, pre-New Deal theory of the Constitution and American politics. Let me start first with the iron of your position. I want to take you folks back. Some of you probably weren't even alive when this happened. It's 1988. I happened to be in graduate school, University of Minnesota. I'm writing my dissertation, but in between writing my dissertation, I'm scraping the clapboard on my house. I needed to do something to take my mind off of writing. And 1988 is an important year, because that year, I think it was 88, we had the Iran-Contra hearings. And I can remember listening on the radio, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North on the radio. I didn't watch it on TV. And with Brendan Sullivan, his chief legal counsel, and they're talking before Congress, testifying about allegations of illegal behavior regarding violation of, of, of the, uh, um, well, basically the Iran Contra um, affair. And I remember at one point, either Brendan Sullivan or Oliver, Oliver North turned to the Democrats, turned to the Senate, and said, All you're doing here is criminalizing policy differences. You're taking differences based upon the fact that you don't like what we're doing and now charging us with violations of the law. And over time, we've heard lots of Republicans make that allegation. They go back to the days of even Watergate and say, this is just the Democrats trying to get Nixon because they didn't like him. Of course, forgetting the fact that many of the people, such as Howard Baker, a Republican, voted, voted also for articles of impeachment. But I've heard over time allegations about Oliver North, Cap Weinberger, about George Bush, Tom DeLay, all of those situations arguing and saying you're just criminalizing behavior that you disagree with. And in some cases, it's correct. In some cases, it was. But in other cases, the Rush Limbos of the world, the Republicans and the psychopaths of the world seem to think that all the Democrats are doing is, is going after and making allegations about criminal behavior. The other day, at the University of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota overpaid for $150,000 for Condoleezza Rice to come and speak. Now, I may not agree with what she did in her administration, in her Bush's administration. I wouldn't charge her with criminal violations of the law. Additionally, a few years ago, John Wu, author of several of the important memos during the Bush administration, was at St. Thomas. I debated him. Wonderful guy. I disagree with him vehemently. I just about everything he argues, everything he stands for. But the disagreement is on policy. It's not on constitutional matters. And the reason why I bring this up, there seems to be a terrible streak in American politics now. A terrible streak. It might have started with Watergate, or it might have started when a bunch of Republicans wanted to go after the President of the United States because he had sex with a woman, whatever it may be, to somehow say that we're going to use allegations of illegality, unconstitutionality, or criminality as a way to attack or address policy differences. And to a large extent, a lot of what Ilya's talking about today, I may or may not agree with what the Obama administration does. It may or may not be good policy. It may or may not be an example of an act or smart administration. But it's not about constitutionality. I like John Lee. He's been dead for a long time. He's got a great quote, though. It's 1960. Kennedy had just been elected. And John Wayne says, I didn't vote for him, but he's my president, and I hope he does a good job. And I love that spirit. I didn't vote for George Bush, but I wished him well. I didn't vote for Ronald Reagan, but I wished him well. And the thing is, I would like to live in a political system where we wish our elected leaders well, regardless of their political ideology. 
and not instead throw a series of arguments about criminality, illegal behavior against them, or unconstitutionality. And that's what's going on here today, in general. I think, in general, my first set of arguments is that a lot of what's being argued today is just that type of attitude. But second, I think there's an enormous confusion here between policy wisdom, capacity of the administration to be good administrators, and constitutional infirmity. I happen to like, once in a while, Scalia, Thomas, and Roberts. And I think you do too. I think they have wonderful things to say once in a while. And they seem to understand something that you fundamentally miss. And that is that there is this difference between whether something is constitutional or legal versus its wisdom. Those of you, or I'm assuming there might be a couple of 1Ls here, some 2Ls, some 3Ls here. Somewhere along the line, you read McCulloch versus Maryland, the famous U.S. bank, you know, the Bank of the United States case. And way back there, John Marshall is credited with what we eventually call the rational basis test. And somewhere in law school, I know in con law, one or civil liberties, whatever, you've talked about rational basis tests that essentially say that so long, assuming in situations that are not covered by what I call Caroline products, footnote four type of issues, when Congress, the state Congress here, has a rational basis to act, the courts will uphold that action. We give enormous deference to Congress and legislative bodies to make policy. Why? Because they are electorally accountable institutions in our political system, and they get the call in a democracy about making policy. And over time, several justices have reminded us of that distinction. John Roberts, National Federation of Business versus Sibelius, that is the constitutionality of the, of, of the, uh, uh, the tax regarding uh, financing of Obamacare, tells us that at one point, because the Constitution permits such a tax, it is not our role to forbid it or to pass upon its wisdom or its fairness. Justice Thomas, Board of, Board of Education of Independent School District, number 92 versus Potawatomi. Court upholds the constitutionality of mandatory drug testing by public schools of students participating in extracurricular activities. Clarence Thomas, in upholding the constitutionality of this policy, we express no opinion as to its wisdom. Justice Scalia, Harlan versus Michigan, regarding mandatory sentencing, in asserting the constitutionality of this mandatory sentence, I offer no judgment on its wisdom. I can quote Justice Harlan, and I can also cut, quote my favorite, Felix Frankfurter, Trump versus Dulles, a law revoking the citizenship of individuals in the United States. For the Constitution has not authorized the judge to sit in judgment on the wisdom of what Congress and the executive branch do. I recognize we're not sitting as judges here, or as justices but their distinction is exceedingly well placed here. That there is a difference between talking about the constitutionality of matters versus their wisdom. There are a lot of things, if I were in charge, I tell my students, if I were making the magic wand, I would do differently. But I'm not in charge. And there are a lot of things, if, the if I could talk to the Obama administration, I would say, I don't think it's smart public policy but it's not my call, it's probably it's constitutional. I might tell them that what they're doing is probably bad administration, but guess what? That's who they are, that's not about, it's not about constitutionality, it's about competence. So I, I caution us to think about that difference here, is that we shouldn't constitutionalize or, or, or declare unconstitutional things simply because we disagree about the public policy. <coughs> How do we resolve public policy differences in the United States? It's called elections. It's called competitive elections. It's called a situation where we hope that people campaign like hell against one another, <coughs> the best side wins, and then we hope for the next two to four to six years, we work like crazy to support one another, and then we campaign like hell against everybody the next time around. Finally, my last cluster of arguments. I'm gonna need nowhere near 20 minutes. Developing I think what we hear is a crab, wooden, pre-New Deal view of the Constitution and politics. Now, as I listen to so many of your arguments here, so many of them work clearly directed against Obamacare, 
delays in terms of requirements, or your interpretations of the, of the Affordable Care Act. Somehow, though, as I listen to all of these, <coughs> it takes me back to thinking this is all about pre-New Deal jurisprudence. It's all about an era when we're looking at a world that's pre-New Deal, pre-Administrative Procedures Act, pre-Chevron, NRDC versus Chevron. I don't know how many of you have taken administrative law. I spent too much time in my life thinking about admin law. And so all this stuff is in my brain here. Uh, a significant amount of the legal challenges surrounding the New Deal take us back in, back in history. If I think about New Deal litigation, two types of New Deal litigation. New Deal 1. New Deal 1, where we saw a series of challenges culminating in cases such as Sheckler Poultry, Carter versus Carter Cole, Petra Refining versus Ryan. You've read them in your classes here. These were cases that took an incredibly narrow, incredibly tightly read view, all about delegation, all about separation of powers. However, the court, the Supreme Court, eventually rejects those notions. In cases, NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation, for example, the court comes to a different thinking about how we need to accommodate how we need to think about presidential power, how we need to think about bureaucratic power within an, a maturing democracy. And it's no longer this, this strictly narrowly construed sense of separation of powers, no longer strictly construing this narrow sense of, of what it means to have delegation. Even in later cases, such as the Strata versus the United States, 1989, the court recognized more flexible ways of thinking about separation of powers. The reason why I make this argument here is think about the second New Deal cases along with the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946. The APA, some people argue, is the way that we constitutionalize bureaucratic decision-making and constitutionalize administrative law within our political system. It recognizes the power of the president and executive agencies to engage in rulemaking. It recognizes the authority of Congress to delegate to agencies to make rules. It also effectively recognizes, along with what political scientists have told us, I put my political scientist hat on now, is that oftentimes public policy lacks clear intent when it's being drafted. Oftentimes Congress is not clear about what the goals are. Or it has policy with multiple goals, throws it off to the bureaucracy and says, you can make sense out of it. And oftentimes administrative agencies are required to do what? To sort out, figure out what the law means, to clarify goals. sometimes they almost have to work from scratch. Even Justice Scalia, especially Justice Scalia, for many years on the bench, has told us there's no such thing as legislative intent. That in many situations, that what we have to do is to figure out that his administrative agencies are oftentimes entrusted with what? Broad rulemaking authority. Chevron versus NRDC, 1984. Scalia, I think at one point, describes it as the reverse Marbury versus Madison. And essentially says that in that case, we have a two-step process in terms, of, in terms of agency rulemaking authority, in terms of ascertaining the intent of Congress. And I won't go through all the details here. The point that I'm simply making here, the point that I'm trying to get at here, is that we have created an a, a administrative decision-making process that recognizes the authority of the president, that recognizes the authority of independent regulatory agencies, and recognizes the power of bureaucracies and administrative agencies to engage in rulemaking, and, and even if not engaging in rulemaking, to have to try to clarify what statutes mean if in fact they are not clear. And cons consistently, Thomas, Scalia, Roberts, the conservatives on the bench, have recognized that. And Chevron, I always tell my students in my admin law classes, if you ever fall asleep in class and I have to call on you and you have to say something intelligent um, to make it look like you've been paying attention, utter out the words, did Chevron resolve that? And you'll get bonus credit for at least saying that. My point is, is that most of us have come to recognize the fact that we, there is broad authority for presidents to act and to clarify rules and for bureaucracy to do that unless clearly prohibited by statute. Make a few last comments about them. The IRS targeting. There's more smoke than there is fire. First off, we do have evidence 
that the IRS, if they targeted it all, they also targeted liberal groups. They did it. They did it in a particularly dumb way by looking at, at, at words and phrases. But on the other hand, if we get beneath what they were doing, what they were trying to do is something legitimate. Try to prevent abuse of IRS tax status to ensure compliance with federal law. Now, did they do it in a hand-handed way? Yeah, they probably did. But the overriding objective to try to ensure compliance with 501c4 of the IRS tax code makes sense. Additionally, outlandish arguments as unconstitutional I certainly hope that as lawyers, you're being trained to advocate and you make your best arguments. We always should do that. But for somebody to say that advocacy of positions is unconstitutional, I don't think so. There's good arguments, there's bad arguments. I should be able to advocate my positions for my clients as a zealous advocate, but simply to say positions that I'm advocating are unconstitutional, I don't think so. Recess appointments, we'll see what the court says. I don't know what the answer is going to be at this one. However, the recess appointments and what Obama did was made necessary by why? By why? By the fact that many people in Congress weren't playing fairly. That there's a certain amount, as I tell my students, that the Constitution and our entire political system requires what? Cooperation on both sides. Why? It takes two to, two to tango. And if one side is purposely setting up sort of a fictitious kind of um, Congress to sort of, sort of be in session as a way of preventing recess appointments. Maybe we have to accommodate. I should also point out that Obama is not the first to do this, if it's the case. That Bush and many other presidents before him have done this. The Montana case, sexual harassment and unwelcome speech. First off, just remind you folks you haven't taken this case law. Mariner Savings versus Vincent in 1986. Justice Rehnquist, writing the majority opinion, said that under the 64 Civil Rights Act, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination. Eventually, the court and the EEOC make a distinction between two forms of sexual harassment, quid pro quo, classic quid pro quo, sleep with me or you're fired, and hostile environment. Hostile environment is creating a situation where, and we can go through a variety of tests here, but creating a hostile environment that makes a, a reasonable person feel un, um, un, um, um, harassed. And, and what we're getting at in terms of hostile environment, one of the definitions, including a definition articulated under who? Clarence Thomas, when he was the EEOC director, was to say, among other things, unwanted sexual language is a form of, 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 of um, sexual harassment. Now, to be unwanted, if I were to come up to you, I'm not, won't you I won't be university professor versus student, it's a whole different story entirely. Uh, but, but at workplace, if I come up to you and ask you out once, or I make a comment about you, and you say, bug off, Schultz, matter is settled. I didn't know if it was wanted or unwanted. But I now know you don't want to be propositioned. You don't want to be hit up. It's that second time, it's that third time that, that poses the problem. And when we look at sexual harassment, it is a problem on campus. It is a problem across the United States in the workplace. But it's also, in, in whatever speech code is being argued was set up here, we must remember that sexual harassment, at least in this case, is a civil matter. It is not a criminal matter that we're talking about here. It is set up in a way where they have civil proceedings on, at universities to address the issues. And it is not uncommon. I do divorces. I do cases for battered women. It is not uncommon in many situations. What's the first thing that you do, even, even before someone's been determined are they actually a harasser? Separate victim from alleged perpetrator. Keep people in their safe corners. Part of Obama's administration is to say, let's separate people. And then yes, it does outline a process for how we address sexual harassment. It does outline a procedure, it does outline evidence. But again, it is a civil proceeding, administrative proceeding, quasi-judicial, but it's clearly not criminal. 
all of this to reasonable action to protect them. All right, my conclusion. I think we just need to be honest here. Honestly, just said, you just don't like some policies? Sorry you lost the election? But take the advice of John Wayne. He's your president, and wish him well. Thank you. Well, Professor Schultz, I think you seem to be, uh, you seem to think that uh, I'm Alex K. Keaton rather than Nicole Shapiro. Uh, I'm here to argue the cause of the Constitution and, and limited government. I'm a libertarian or classical liberal. I'm not here arguing uh, Republican partisan points. Uh, I'm not here to say, you know, Nixon's my guy. I mean, Nixon is the biggest violator. So much of this stuff, uh, whether it's you know, Watergate or whether it's uh, uh, all sorts of policies that, 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 that he put in. This is not a Republican Democrat thing. I mean, the issue with Iran Contra, and I actually, this tells you something. Uh, I was nine years old. I watched some of that hearing. I do remember some of Oliver North's testimony on, on TV. They didn't really have much at the time. But, uh, you know, that the major issue there, there was no question there was criminal activity. The main issue, it seemed to me, was did Reagan know? How much did he know? How much did he authorize? That's kind of a a different, and that, that will come up in the uh, in the IRS uh, discussion as well. It already has. You know, was, did this come from the White House? Did it was it just a rogue field office? You know, who was Lois Lerner? What is she doing? What's her connection? You know, which which are which are separate issues. And, and you know, to the extent that that's an issue, sure, there's some criminality involved. But most of this is not about criminalizing policy differences. It's not even about policy differences at all. It's about does the Constitution place any limits on federal power? executive or otherwise. I kind of focused on executive, but you know, we can go into the finer points of whether it be the, the Don Frank or the Affordable Care Act or, or, or anything else. But you know, I thought I made clear that there are, this isn't about policies. You know, I agree with immigration reform. I uh, would love for more or most or all of Obamacare to be delayed or you know, universal exemptions permanently for everyone, always. Uh, that would be fantastic. You know, repeal. You know, Obama couldn't just repeal it unilaterally. Which I would love for him to do, um, or 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 you know, ham-handed governance or what have you. you. Know, having a bad website you didn't hear me mentioning. That's not a constitutional violation, or you know, maladministration or bad PR or bad politics for that matter. This is not. I, I, I really hope that you know what came across, and I'll, I'll deal with your uh, allegation of my having a crab or, or wooden perception of the Constitution. That's another thing. That's more on the merits. But this is not about policy differences. You know. We, that's not what this debate is about. It's, uh, again, uh, does the Constitution, does the structure of the Constitution impose any limits on what the federal government, and most of what I talk about, the executive branch, uh, can do? Uh, Cato, uh, I, I was still in you know, school and a junior associate, so I wasn't so much involved in policy uh, debate, but uh, uh, libertarians, Cato, have criticized lots of presidents, every president, including Bush, including you know, uh, uh, everyone. But I'll tell you what, you know, Bush, for example, was criticized on signing statements, right? He would sign something and said, you know, provisions, you know, 17 and 34 are not going to enforce that they're unconstitutional. He was criticized for that because, well, how can you sign on constitutional law, et cetera? You know, there's a debate back and forth. Does the president, you know, the real problem here is omnibus bills that have all these different sections, you know, should we veto the whole thing? You know, that's an academic debate. Um, uh, when Obama uh, issues signing statements, which he's done uh, as well, when he does things, it's, or when he issues waivers or, or delays, it's not because he thinks parts of the laws are unconstitutional. It's for policy reasons, political reasons. He just issued a signing statement the other day, uh, the, uh, last week. Uh, the, the, the bill to, the law to prohibit uh, former terrorists from coming into the country as ambassadors. And he signed the bill, and then he said he wouldn't enforce it to the extent that it uh, violates the president's power over foreign affairs. Well, this wasn't an omnibus bill with lots of other things that were clearly constitutional. So that was the only part of the bill. I mean, why not veto that? Because that would make him look bad politically and say, you know, he does this. So even on, you know, issues like that, and, you know, I'm not saying that Bush is right in, in everything he did, but, but no means. But there's a different mindset about the role that the Constitution uh, plays. And you talked about Chevron and administrative law, and, you know, that's a whole uh, debate that's much drier and probably draw fewer people even with this good food here. I think it's the most exciting part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I don't think even the most hardened believer in Chevron and administrative deference would say that administrative agencies can simply write new law. 
without any guidance whatsoever. Um, this is something that came out in Justice Kennedy's questioning in the Hobby Lobby case, the, the contraceptive mandate. Uh, he said, you know, because you know, in that case, which I'm, I'm not going to uh, rehash, but the, the law, the Affordable Care Act, does not require coverage of contraceptives and all these other things, the problematic things. All it says was preventative health care. And then HHS put in a what said that preventative health care includes contraceptives, and contraceptives includes this list of 20 things that have to be covered. Um, and uh, you know, so even before we get to the point of you know religious liberty and what does that mean with you know generally applicable laws and things like that, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you know, there's some foundational question of you know have we gone too far with this administrative agencies and these are the questions that are being asked. In, in Hulbig and King, these, the IRS tax credit subsidy things, when the text of the law says one thing, and as Judge uh, Raymond Randolph, Randolph of DC Circuit said a few weeks ago in an oral argument, you know, we're supposed to prevent you know, absurd interpretations of, of the law, uh, but what about stupid laws? We're not supposed to fix stupid laws. Uh, uh, he's saying if the law doesn't work, you know, courts aren't supposed to really fix them. So look, I mean, at the end of the day, um, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, like, you know, I'm not saying that the crazy arguments before the Supreme Court are unconstitutional. I'm talking more generally about uh, a mindset that this administration up to its very highest echelons has towards uh, our nation's founding document, whether it's inconvenient or outdated or, uh, you know, how, how it needs to be placated. As Justice Kennedy, you know, I see your Roberts and Scalia and Thomas and raising Justice Kennedy said, in the United States versus Bond, another unanimous uh, opinion that would have been unanimous against the government, except the government ended up conceding error uh, when the Supreme Court took it after it had lost, uh, after it had uh, uh, lost in the, uh, in the Third Circuit. Uh, and it's come up again now on, on the merits question. But he, he talked about, uh, and I commend this to you all, the United States versus Bond, uh, this great several pages about the importance of structure, whether that be separation of powers or checks and balances or what have you, to protect liberty. Because at the end of the day, the Constitution isn't some, you know, dry uh, 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 road map or uh, instruction manual for government, organogram for government. Uh, that's kind of a display of an application of James Madison's brilliance and how much he learned, that, learned it by all the modern Princeton. Um, it's there, that structure is there, uh, even if we had no Bill of Rights, to protect liberty. To, to have that, that gridlock, to make it hard to pass laws unless there were uh, sustained majorities in two houses, um, and the president signs it. Uh, you know, the, if, if the framers had wanted uh, uh, it to be easy to pass laws and have government, they would have chosen a parliamentary form or they would have chosen some other form with fewer separations of power, less federalism, federalism as well. You know, dividing power makes it harder <coughs> to achieve certain things, but. That was the choice they made. Because there's a danger whenever government uses its force of, of uh, infringing on individual liberties of various kinds. And that's what this is ultimately about. This is not about my or anyone else's disagreeing with something that Obama might do. It's the question that's increasingly been asked, whether under Bush or now under Obama, where do you get the power to do this? And that's a healthy response. I saw a hand up there. Yeah, I have one question um, for you, uh, Mr. Shapiro. Um, just to kind of go off of what uh, Professor Schultz said, I'm curious, um, when the Constitution was um, put, uh, put together by the framers, uh, I think it was a different time. Well, obviously it was a different time, but I think the relationships between the different founders were different, <coughs> the president and Congress and so forth. And I think this is a very interesting presidency and, and, and administration, <clears throat> excuse me, because some of the issues that he has to deal with, specifically Congress stating that they want him to fail, and by all means they're going to make sure that he, he fails, that's their job. Um, you have different members of the Republican Party saying that. So <coughs> would you agree that, I mean, if it was a Republican, president, um, maybe he would have to use all the tools in his toolbox to kind of um, do the best that he could. Yeah, we're arguing I mean, what the tools in the toolbox are. Um, I'm, I'm saying that what Obama's doing, and as I said, all, all presidents, 
from time immemorial. You know, maybe Washington is absolved of this, although I'm sure you can find examples as well. Uh, you know, the, the framers understood this. Uh, every everybody with power is going to try to expand their own power, whether you're an elected official or a bureaucrat or um, you know, state, local, federal, what have you. Uh, and that's why uh, power counteracts power. For that matter, faction counteracts faction. Federalist ten. Uh, and so, you know, it might be bad for the health of our uh, politics for Republicans to be saying that they want to bomb and fail. And sure, similar statements were said about Bush. I mean, these are back-to-back -back tremendously polarizing presidencies. It's, it's not a good thing, regardless of what your politics are. Um, and, and so, you know, ultimately the, the people are going to have to resolve this. I and mean, there are two pretty irreconcilable visions of government or between Congress and the White House. Um, uh, and uh, you know, that's it's not necessarily, you know, as a libertarian, I would, you know, all things being equal, I'd rather the government do nothing than the government do something. So um, you know, that might be a, a good thing, except you know, this president decides that when Congress doesn't do something, then he gets to do it anyway. Uh, and that's you know, whether you know, he needs to take his case to the people. And the people need to elect his supporters based on his policy views or his views of what needs to get done. Uh, and that's how you win the argument. You don't uh, you know, take extra constitutional means. So is this the only president to use executive orders in this way? Well, I don't know what you mean by, by this way. I mean, it's not a matter, it's not a, executive orders, so let, let's be clear. An executive order is an executive action that's been, you know, niceified and put in a proper memo with lots of citations and stuff like this. This president hasn't issued more executive orders than past presidents. Uh, it's generally on the, on the same number of executive orders. But in terms of the uh, uh, kind of executive actions, I mean, there's some pretty outlandish things here. Um, you know, Obamacare itself, when you have this uh, thing that was saved by John Roberts' you know, head-scratching uh, transmogrification of a, of a legislative provision, um, you know, we're, we're sort of in a, in a new world, you know, against the consistent opposition of the, of the American people you know, from the very beginning. The only piece of major transformative uh, social legislation, socioeconomic legislation, that was not bipartisan, uh, that did not command a majority of the American public. Um, you see that again and again. So, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of banal to say you know every every age is new or you know unprecedented or or, or what have you. Um, but so it's it's not about you know the number of actions or the number of orders, but it's the type of things that are that are being done. Uh, despite fear, fierce opposition, not just by the opposition of the party, but by the American people. Can I chime in? Good. I, I think you're fundamentally correct. I mean, I mean, what we're, I mean, we're looking at, I think, two different visions of the Constitution. There's no question about that here. And, and there's a variety of ways of articulating this. You know, I, I, I too teach Federalist 10 and 51. I spend a lot of time talking all about checks and balances, all about factions, and all about the fears. The van be clear in my car is Federalist 51. Right, okay. okay. That's the, men, <laughs> that's the uh, men aren't angels. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Exactly, exactly. And there's women, too. There's two women, too. Okay. okay. Women are more angelic than men. I tell my wife that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Smart move on your part. Okay. But, but what, what, what I get at here is that I, I would tell my students that fundamentally the problem of politics if we can accept Federalist 10 and 51 as oh. an insight into what the Constitution is about. Again, we can have a great discussion together if Federalist 10 and 51 um, a great insight into the Constitution, or is it just political propaganda back in 1776? That's a whole different historical debate, of course. Okay? But, but I always tell them and say that assuming Federalist 10 and 51 is accurate in terms of insight into James Madison, you know, primary author of the Constitution, it tells us that the problem of politics, as I as described here, is reconciling majority faction with individual liberty and popular government. The whole threat of majority faction. I sometimes update it to say the critical question that our Constitution and our Bill of Rights is about, and I think this is where fundamentally we agree, is that it's preserving liberty. It's preserve it's, it's that balancing of majority rule and minority rights. You know, and we can formulate in lots of ways. There's the Tatakta Lane language. Well, that's why we institute government in the first place, to secure and protect our liberty. Yeah, and it's, and it's also, as, as, it's also as Madison says, that you know we we also have to worry about the fact that we are not angels, that left to our own devices, we probably might not be able to be as cooperative and, 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 and as possible. And the reason why I mention this is that I clearly agree 
There's no question that the Constitution is fundamentally a document all about preserving liberty in many ways. And that I also fundamentally agree with, with the concept that, that, that um, Alexander Hamilton articulates in, I think, is it Federalist 84, when he argues against the, against the Bill of Rights, I can't remember if it's 84 or 86, I can't remember where it is, where he says, we don't need a we, we don't need no stinking Bill of Rights, it's updating it to this day. And he says that because we that that a constitution is a is a limiting document. It's a, a, a document, but a power conferring document. Um, a document that, that says that if the feds, if the constitution doesn't give the power to the feds, they can't do it. I'm sort of putting it in my own language. And so I agree. That, that the federal government, unlike state governments, um, are limited in what they can do. The question is, how do we understand what those limits are, what those constitutional limits are upon the federal government? And what I want to suggest is that we have to understand those limits in light of subsequent amendments to the Constitution, in light of judicial precedent, in light of, I would even argue, changing times. Now, I am clearly not saying here that we can ignore plain text of Constitution, but we have to read it in light of a lot of events and a lot of things that have happened between now and 1787. And part of those things that have happened have been things such as the 14th Amendment, such as the New Deal, such as the Administrative Procedures Act. And we have to understand how the Constitution is read in terms of balancing power in light of those things. I'm reading a fascinating book right now, that everybody's going to agree, Jerry Mishaw, um, who I think is one of the sharpest law professors in the country, who's an expert on administrative law, and is talking about our lost first hundred years of, of, of administrative law. It's a really quite good book. And he talks about how, guess what, even in those first years under the Washington and Adams and Jefferson et al. administrations, there was concerns about, about balancing administrative discretion about defining presidential authority. And even in those early days, we saw significant departures from what seems to be the clear expressed language in the document, even among framers, or they weren't sure what it meant. And all I'm getting at here is that what they sought to do, what history has sought to do in the United States, and what we're seeing occur is reasonable efforts to try to accommodate the realities of modern day society, the realities of, 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 of modern day government within the language of a document that is not necessarily completely clear in terms of what it requires. And so we can disagree. We can just disagree on, on the nature of constitutionalism on one level. But we are in agreement on one thing. If, if that feds can't do it, the president can't do it, if the power ain't written there, and I do fundamentally agree that the Constitution is a decision-making document that outlines structures that are also there to not just preserve liberty, which I think is the most important thing, but also somewhere out there it's all about also the common good and the public good. Because in Federalist 10, in defining a faction, Madison tells us factions are groups animated by some common impulse or passion united against the common good or the rights of others fundamental belief that somewhere out there that we're not a suicide pact. We're here for the purpose of what? Also articulating the public good. That's right. The government can't use those limited powers that it gets for anything other than the general welfare. So the general welfare clause is actually a further limitation on the use of federal power. So earmarks, quite apart from being you know, law and rolling and you know, the bridge to nowhere and all of, you know, those sorts of you know, sheet museums and things like that, that kind of funny. Uh, are also unconstitutional because they're not for the general welfare. Um, so my question is more on a, on a historical context. How can we reconcile policies that are openly uh, going to generate uh, different groups in American society to go against each other, uh, like, for example, the health care law, uh, to what has historically been the same case in looking into social welfare programs like Social Security, uh, openly criticized at first, and now programs in which most Americans hope to rely on at some point in their senior years. Um, so again, I wouldn't if I were. Right, most, most do. That doesn't include me, because it's broken. But how do you we reconcile that? Carol, with how, that? That's right. Okay. How do you reconcile the fact that throughout times, we've had the same issues where we reach a obvious you know, social problem that needs a fixing, 
government has sometimes stepped in legally or not to resolve the problem. And then after a few decades, we tend to rely on them and accept them, and everyone stops talking about them. Well, like I said, like I mentioned, uh, Obamacare is fundamentally different from Social Security or Medicare or you know, pick whatever the American Disabilities Act, whatever your major piece of legislation, like list of major pieces of legislation might be, because it wasn't bipartisan. Uh, and you know, not just it wasn't bipartisan, but it was you know, underwater in terms of approval rating uh, in the public. Uh, and, you know, uh, at a certain point, um, we're going to stop talking about Obamacare, we're going to talk about how bad the health care system is. Uh, yeah, you know, what we have now is kind of a you know, whether you repeal or you repeal most of it or, you know, you change it. I mean, at, at a certain point, it's semantics. Uh, and part of the reason why it's such a bad law is because there wasn't buy-in, there wasn't compromise, there wasn't a grand bargain uh, of, you know, two-thirds of the of Congress or the public or anything like this. And that's why we, we have to, you know, we have a third straight election where Obamacare is a, an issue. The only reason why, uh, and, and Obama was re-elected despite it, the only candidate that couldn't run really effectively against uh, Obamacare is going to be number. Uh, although, you know, this is the paucity of the Republican position in 2012, uh, of the people who actually ran, Romney was the best candidate. And that's a terrible thing to recognize, but that's, you know, who could have done better than Romney? Other people who actually ran. The problem was nobody did ran. So, um, you know, um, that's, that's the big issue with Obamacare. It's not, it's not been accepted because it wasn't, you know, it's not, it's, you know, the recalcitrant minority eventually goes away or accepts it or whatever, but here it's, you know, the majority, the recalcitrant majority, if you will, only grows. I have a question for Professor Schultz. You talked about um, the Constitution needing to keep up with the current times. And uh, in your opinion, what's a more legitimate way of keeping the Constitution updated? Is it, you know, the Supreme Court interpreting certain phrases into the Constitution or kind of adjudicating at their whim, or is it a, an actual constitutional convention? Is it amending it via the processes that the Constitution outlines? The way you phrase it, it's like phrasing the, do you still beat your wife kind of question. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I beat her up every morning. She gets up at 5.40, I get up at 5.35. All right, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, we have a similar rate, right? If she gets up at 9.40, I get up at 9.30. Okay, okay, so, okay, okay, so we have par parallel, okay, but, but, it's a, it's a good question. Okay, first off, do I think that the framers had the wisdom to anticipate absolutely everything that would happen in the subsequent 200, 300, 400 years, however long the American um, society is going to operate? No, I don't. Um, do I view the framers as, as giving us advice on, on a basic structure for our political system? I do. And the reason why I say that is that there are some situations where I, I think it's clear, you know, what, you know, what, the, what the framers had in mind and, and what the framers, were, uh, what the text of the Constitution says. And that situation, you know, then we, then we read it accordingly. But again, this is almost like getting to be a, a 1L kind of, you know, law school kind of question in terms of, okay, what does it mean to say speech? You know, you know, um, what is a valid public use? I've written more books on eminent domain than to shake a stick at. Um, you know, what's considered to be a valid public use? You know, you know, what is, what is, it, you know, what does it mean to things? And I can pick other clauses of the Constitution in terms of what's free exercise mean. And the reason why I say that is that we clearly have to figure out, you know, you know, what it is, you know, the framers were trying to do, what what that should be mean in light of contemporary circumstances, and to try to interpret accordingly. Would I like to see constitutional amendments? Yeah, I think constitutional amendments. Um, we've got 20, the 27th, 27, 27, 27, 27, we have constitutional amendments. Um, we I study have, that for my naturalization test as well. Yeah, so it's, I'm, I'm just trying to remember. I always forget about that last one that passed, yeah. you know, which is the one that was or the original 12. All right. Um, so you got to remember that one. So, so, um, so we got 27 amendments. We have, on top of that, we have the potential for a constitutional convention, which has never occurred, but also, at least, I think, since Marbury versus Madison, um, we've recognized the authority of the court, you know, you know, to interpret the Constitution. 
And that interpretation, uh, depending on your semantics, is that amending the Constitution? Some would say yes. Some would say it's trying to give legitimate meaning to try to figure out how's the best way to figure out what the Constitution means. And we can have a good debate in terms of saying, is it only by looking at the intent of the framers? And we can ask who the framers were. Um, is it a living Constitution debate? I think that debate is kind of wooden. I mean, we sort of set it up like, you know, you know less filling can taste great kind of debate or something like that. I would simply say that, you know, in, ter terms, in, term, in terms of trying to understand what the Constitution means today, there's lots of things that come to bear in terms of trying to figure out what, what, what and how we apply the Constitution. And so when you sort of set up the question in terms of saying, is it this, this, or this, um, I'm not sure that's the right question to ask. But to me, the, the, the more correct question is, is, is understanding the various components that I think that do come in to how the courts have to look at the Constitution when making interpretations. Social Security is the answer to that question. I thought it was possible to bring that in. Okay. Social Security, when passed, um, was pretty controversial from a constitutional perspective. You know, the, the argument was very plausible, and I still think this is correct, that the Constitution doesn't authorize this kind of wealth redistribution for you know, very good reasons. Originally, it was to support widows and orphans. And the states were supposed to do this sort of thing in civil society. Nevertheless, as with this, as with other um, kind of New Deal uh, programs, uh, the President wrote to the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, don't let any doubts about the constitutionality of this legislation, no matter how uh, reasonable, uh, preclude you from passing it. And, and away we went. You know, why amend the Constitution when you just ram it through Congress? But it, that seems, you know, you know, why do that? Why do that damage to our rule of law, where we're, you know, understanding that it's unconstitutional, but it's really important, so we'll pass it anyway. Surely, something like Social Security helping widows and orphans at the time of, you know, the Depression, uh, you could have passed a constitutional amendment to do that, right? And if not, well, that should tell you something then you know, the people really hold to their constitutional vision and, and they don't believe in that. Uh, I mean, I think right now, you know, people ask me, does that mean, you know, oh, wait, did you just say that Helbring was decided incorrectly and Social Security is not constitutional? Well, yeah, but if the Supreme Court decided that case today, what they would do would be to strike it down and then stay their opinion for a year to allow for a constitutional amendment, which would pass overwhelmingly and immediately, um, which would be fine. We'd, have, we'd end up with the same result but our rule of law would be strengthened because then you know, the policy would actually be propped up with something. But instead, we go into this, and this ties into your rational basis comment, this uh, vicious cycle of infinite deference between the legislature and the courts. Whatever the legislature does, whether it be state or, or federal, um, that is for the general welfare, well, you know, they're the popularly elected branches, we'll just defer to them. And then the legislature says, well, who knows whether this is constitutional or not? We're not judges. We'll just defer that question to the courts. Who said, well, you know, Congress probably had a good reason for doing this. That's rational. And, and, and that is how uh, uh, you have the erosion. Rather than constitutional amendments. I'm a big fan of constitutional amendments. You know, the attitude now seems to be like, oh, no, we can't invoke Article 5. That's only for, like, people voting and stuff like that. You know, very, very important thing. You can't, it shouldn't. Well, that's not what the framers said. And for a long time, we had constitutional amendments, which stopped. <coughs> Anybody have any last minute questions? My Twitter handle is at iShapiro. <laughs> My email is iShapiro at Cato.org. I welcome to follow up discussion. Thank you very much for, for having me. Welcome to before I have to depart back to uh, cold DC. <laughs>